And me standing here, I am Cecilia Christerson, and I'm the chairperson for the Swedish Association of Univers Universities uh, Institutions uh, uh, Refugee Committee. Uh, but I also am the uh, Pro Vice Chancellor at Malmö University with responsibility for global engagement and challenge based learning. I think the only one in the world with a nice title. But you can understand my engagement, and I have been chairing this committee since 2016. Uh, we have also had a um, similar um, seminar last year in Stockholm uh, with a focus, and I will get back to what the conclusions were from that seminar, because this is like a follow-up seminar. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge that this seminar here is hosted by Support Group Network, that we are here. Thank you very much for actually being here, and um, we are very grateful for that. Uh, European Asso University Association, uh, and as I mentioned, the Association of Swedish Higher Education Institutions, and also uh, Institute for Center Sweat and University of West. So this is really an effort where we all get together with different perspectives. And before I get started introducing you to the seminar, I have been really well um, uh, guided here to tell you about the exits here. We have emergency exits here, over there, and down to the left. So you know that you exactly know where to go. We also have bathrooms down to the left, two of them, and also we're going to have the coffee break in this room. Was that all? So I didn't forget anything about the practical issues. Good. Thank you very much. So um, I will give you some sort of a background. Uh, I will also say that I welcome you all because I know we have representation from ten countries, around 10 countries, that depends on how we're counting, but I would definitely welcome all our European participants that have been traveling quite far to get here. You are also very welcome, of course. So the background is a little bit that last year uh, we had uh, the first conference that was very much focused on uh, how inclusive and open are universities um, receiving refugee academics? Uh, and also, how can we be a part of the introduction to the workforce in Sweden? And it was a really, really good uh, conference, I think. It also gave us the foundation for giving recommendations to the government. And you can see those four recommendations here. Uh, to ensure that competences of foreign academics are acknowledged in order to support the labor market's needs. Uh, studies in higher education should be discussed along with employment as an equal condition for a permanent residence permit. We had foreign academics with nearly finished degrees should also have access to complementary upgrading courses leading to degree. And more higher education institutions would be able to offer these types of bridging courses for accessibility in the whole country. As we know, refugees are placed spread all over the country, and it's hard to get access to uh, universities. Also, which is very important, I'm going to hear more of that today, develop a systematic and nationally recognized validation process for uh, prior learning. And finally, that we all want the Swedish higher education institutions to provide relevant language education and certificate that ensures that the applicant has relevant language pre-qualifications to succeed in their studies if they continue on the programs at universities. And of course also that student career counseling, access to mentors and relevant information courses on the Swedish labor market should be made easily accessible. So these were four recommendations. As you know, we still really we sent this in to the government in the summer from the SU, from the Association of Swedish University Institutions. And uh, as you know, we don't still have a government. So uh, waiting in for the government, we will of course join forces and present this all over again. So it's good that we have these recommendations. But what I think we really sort of uh, understood very early was that we we need to involve refugee and refugee organizations in this dialogue and also how we frame um, the intentions, what we would like to change. 
we have a lot of recommendations. We don't need more recommendations. We don't need more policies. We are overwhelmed with all these documents. And as Hannah Smith uh, sent out, you will have a list, even if it's called a short list, I think it's a very long list, <laughs> but you can find definitely um, policies. So we don't need to come up with more policies. What we do need to do together today is to find directions on what priorities we're going to do and make now in the nearest future to move and advance the possibilities for refugees to enter the labor market and also enter to universities. So I think it's very clear, clearly described what our mission is here today. So we are expecting at the end of the conclusion panel to have some really good uh, strategies for how we go forward. Now, Last week, Malmö University was visited by the UNESCO chair, Charles Hopkins, and at the same time, and I think you all received it, was the UNESCO report. I hope you have got that in the mail. And it's really worth reading that report. And uh, I thought just briefly, you know, we all know this, that there is um, estimated 65, good 65 million people that are uh, asylum seekers and displaced people in the world today. I think it's also quite important to know that every minute, every minute, 24 people are displaced. Uh, we also think that half of the world's refugees are children under the 18 years of 18, 18 years of age, and half of them have fled violence. We should have that in mind. We should also have in mind that every length time of refugees spent in exile is about 20 years. And that is a very productive time of your life, whatever end of your life that 20 year period is. So I will of course lift that recommendation that came out last week. And migration, displacement and education, building bridges, not walls. And really, it's really worth reading from, from the first page to the last page. It's about 400 pages, so I think you can smooth that off quite easily. But the recommendations are not new, uh, and as you can see here, it is very much in line while we are here, uh, that education plays an important role for people to be included in society. Education plays an important role for democracy. And of course also, diversity is what we really would like to see and support throughout whatever country we really are represented here. And I think one part here, I think it's just really interesting, is about uh, represent migration and displacement histories in education accurately to challenge prejudices. And I think that's one additional part that we haven't discussed earlier. From this report, briefly, I was very happy to see this. I don't know if you see that. That dot all the way on the top, it says Sweden. And this is a survey that was done 2016 in 14 countries. Unfortunately, France is not in here, so I was looking for France, but it was probably not in this uh, uh, inquiry. The quiz was actually in this uh, question addressing uh, endorsement of all ethnic and racial groups should enjoy an equal rights. That is one part. That is the one that you have on the um, vertical axis. And on the uh, horizontal axis, it's equal rights for all ethnic or racial group is good for democracy. So those were the two dimensions that they were asking about. And the 14 countries came up according to those in framework here. Uh, so there is a reason, I think, why we are in Sweden doing this. And I also think there's a reason for Sweden to continue being in the forefront for this issue of democracy and supporting refugees. So, of course, that is, is uh, nothing to argue about. Um, the program today, shortly, we build the program here, that we will have a welcoming panel that we, again, the one that are responsible and supporting this event, will talk about their thoughts about, very shortly, what we are all about here to do today. Uh, we will have really is a good presentation that would be inspiring for our workshops in the afternoon. Uh, after lunch, we would then set up the workshops, and as you can see here, they are divided into two groups. One group that would talk about initiatives that support diversity, inclusion, and democracy in higher education. 
And the other one is initiative for evaluation and integration. At the end, we will ask the two chairs, which is Deputy Vice Chancellor Don Teleander from University West and Hannah Smith, the Senior Advisor from the European University Association, to somewhat conclude what have come up in the um, workshops. And then we also have a final panel that will sort of give us the directions that we thought about, that I discussed earlier. So that is the framework for today's work. And I will do my best to hold uh, time. I'm myself, I'm sort of sometimes talk, doing too much talking, but I think we all can enjoy that in a way too. Before we start, I would like to read some lines uh, from the book, One of Millions, A Journey of Exile from Darfur. And I'm very happy that we do have the author here. Sadlin Ibrahim, Ibrahim, could you please just stand up so we all can see you. You are a bachelor student at Malmö University studying human rights. And you've been in Sweden for about four years. And your journey is so fantastically described here in a way of understanding background, the things that you went through, and also what the version is that when you come to a new country, what do you actually do? So thank you for sharing this. And this book, we really would like to have more prints and copies from, and we will do our best to see that. But I will read one of the first pages at the end, um, because I think it really reflects many of, of, of you here, and I think what we can look upon for refugees having their story told. So bear with me, I'm going to read like a couple of sections here. As I walked, many thoughts went through my mind. I thought about everyone I was leaving behind and everything I had lost. My family in Sudan, my family in Egypt. I thought of my grandmother, parents and siblings, about my beautiful wife and the child she had been carrying in her womb. I remembered her lying on the ground, bleeding, as I begged for her forgiveness for me not having been able to protect her and our child, and for abandoning her without making sure she received a proper burial. What had I done so wrong that I deserved this suffering and isolation? Before things had started to fall apart, I was a law student, and my family, my entire village, had such high expectations of me. I came to, so close to realizing my dream of developing my village my region and my country. How did things turn out so terribly wrong? How did I end up having to flee my country and leave all my ambitions, dreams and loved ones behind? And now I was fleeing once more. Four hundred pages later we read this. I am one of millions of Darfuris who have been forced to flee their homes since the genocide in Darfur began. One over 65 million forcibly displaced people worldwide. It seems like my long journey has come to its end in a country that has accepted and welcomed me. I wish for all displaced persons to find a place to call home, but most of all I wished for peace. I wish for peace so people do not have to flee their homes in the first place. And those who are in exile can return to their homelands and to their families. I still dream about being reunited with my family again one day. So thank you, Sadlin, for all your words in this book. So, now I'm going to start out with welcoming up here our panel of the people who have been really nicely to support this event. So Adnan Abdul Ghani, could you please join me up here? You are the initiator of Support Group Network here in Estagor. And we met many times back in 2015, I think. I would like to invite up the uh, Vice Chancellor of, uh, of University West, Martin Hellström. Uh, I would also like to welcome up 
the attaché of culture, education and research, Sandrine Pestas, for Institut Francais de Suède. And I would like to invite the General Secretary of the um, Association of Swedish University Institutions, Marita Hiliges. And finally, also, a person that has been really the project leader of this whole event, and that is Hannah Smith, Senior Advisor at European University Associations. And we have given you a very short framework here, so you have to do this very quickly, but I know you've been thought, thinking a lot about what you're going to say, but it was important for us to have you all on stage here. So please, should you start, Anna? I'll hand over the microphone to you, or could we have it like this? Why don't we give a big hand first? Uh, I would like to start with uh, thanking all of you to join us here in Restaurant, which is the biggest asylum camp in Sweden. Uh, right now, uh, you know, during the last three years, we had 1,000, always one, around 1,500 refugees in, in this uh, uh, accommodation or camp. Uh, refugees with all kinds of competence, skills, and ambitions. Um, we, uh, we, we try to, it, it is a very simple it for us, because uh, I came and all the colleagues from the support group network, we all lived here. We came as an asylum seekers. Uh, from 2014, 15, 16, and we lived in this camp for long periods. Uh, and we started uh, the support group network together. And uh, right now I'm working with Save the Children uh, as a project leader for uh, Children on the Move. Uh, this is as a, my job, and my, one of my also job is to spread the concept that we started here in this particular camp to all Sudan. Right now, uh, we, we, and we work with the, with the sense of self-organization, empowerment of refugees, that we are the target group, and it's enough that others talking about us, it's good, but it's not good enough. We have to have the right tools, resources, to speak out for ourselves, to be part of what they call the integration process to be part of solutions and, uh, and to be part of explaining what kind of challenges we have. So uh, mainly we use self-organization tools and strategic corporations with the local societies as well. So we, we've been working for four years only by the support of the local society, everyone in this society, the NGOs, the churches, the communes, the universities around us, Everyone was supporting our efforts to self-organize and be part of, of uh, the projects. And, for, for, from, uh, and, and this, uh, through my work in uh, with Save the Children, I, we had the chance to spread this concept all around Sweden. So we spread that concept of self-organization, we call it the support group, to 16 refugee, other refugee camps in all over Sweden, to 13 cities, not only like that, also to, uh, to Germany, to Stuttgart, and we have the representative from the uh, Student Council and the Support Group Network in Stuttgart, in the city, and also in Norway. Uh, and we're hoping to start uh, next year in France as well. So uh, the, the, the main idea that uh, about what we think about when we, the first we got the call for this conference, it was like really what we hoped for for a long, long, long time. Because We've been advocating for more over four years here in Sweden that we can't have conferences and we can't have meetings discussing refugees' challenges and problems, you know. And we, we look at the room, there's no refugee representation in these, uh, in these uh, conferences. How we can know about really what is their challenges? How we can really know that the solutions and recommendations that we come with are going to work? with this target group. We have to include the target group. And if we look at uh, today, I'm, I'm looking forward so much to share best practices between the different universities. Uh, but I'm looking forward also to see that we could, ha we could have recommendations from our uh, point of view as a uh, refugee organization, that we could see refugees part of any integration, inclusion, 
uh, work towards the refugees themselves. Let the refugee, or your target group, whatever, even if you're working with students, let them be part of the planning of these projects. Let them be part of the implementation, and if possible, let them lead and organize these, uh, these, uh, these projects. Give them the empowerment and the and and the, and not only the empowerment, the self-esteem that they are they worth something. Because what we suffer from that we had a great welcoming, I think, in all Europe. But we were treated like victims. We were treated like someone you can sit and we're gonna do things for you. But we have a lot of competence. I don't want to feel a burden. I want to feel like. Uh, an opportunity for someone. I want to feel that they need me. They want me. In Stuttgart, when the first time we visited Stuttgart, I was astonished by the, the mayor there, and when he stood up in front of uh, almost uh, 500 audience, half of them are refugees, telling that we need you here. Take all that crap about humanitarian and we want to give. We need you for our country. You could see, I had a lot of discussions with all the refugees in the room, how much they felt proud. They felt that I mean something. I'm needed. I'm not a burden. They start to move from this victim mode to survival mode. They, they believe that they are survivors, not only victims. So I think it's very important if we could really give this uh, opportunity for refugees to, to be part of the implementation organization and let them be part of the evaluation of these projects as well. I think this is for us, working for years here, having all these facilities here and uh, all operated fully by refugees, asylum seekers, let me be more particular as well, you know, all by this simple ingredients, including the target group in our work. Let them lead and let them, uh, let them uh, be the, the ones who uh, take the lead in these work. So I hope that this day come with practical steps, how we can include really our target group in our projects in a practical way, where they are partners, not only subject to our projects. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Cecilia. And uh, I would like to point out two aspects or areas more generally. Um, uh, the first is about uh, the impact of the higher education institutions. As a rector of universities in Sweden, I can speak for higher education level and uh, research at universities. Our teachers and researchers meet thousands of students every day. Together they meet thousands of partners to our universities every day. We are doing research together and share the responsibility for high quality in our higher education programs with many partners in society and companies. So we reach many people, society and work life every day. In our research and education we reach out not only to students in Sweden, but to students all over the world. We can say that our education and research of today have a strong impact not only on the current generation, but also on coming generations. We are talking about thousands and thousands of people all over the world, and I'm not really sure about that we and our teachers and researchers are aware about this most amazing fact. So when we are talking about supporting diversity, inclusion and dem democracy today, we do not need to find more problems and obstacles somewhere in the systems or elsewhere. We have done that and it has not brought any fundamental or rapid changes. It's much more about leadership in our universities. It's about relevant strategic documents. It's about strong mission statements by all our staff. How do we reach out to our students with our missions? in order to support diversity, inclusion and democracy? How can our specific academic disciplines contribute to that? It's about priority, courage and generosity when we really want to change things. We all have to make our role bigger than it looks like in our employment contracts. 
the other area or aspect is about mutual cooperation between uh, university and universities and actors uh, out of the universities. As Vice Chancellor of uh, University West, I'm proud of having work integrated learning as profile and position in our brand. And I'm even proud of that our promise is to create knowledge in mutual cooperation with partners outside the university. So it was very given that we, in order to that, signed the contract between support group that worked uh, here and uh, University West. Because our belief on building knowledge in mutual cooperation builds on different starting points, for example the following three, uh, that building knowledge primarily is based on the concept of knowledge exchange, not knowledge transfer, like uh, we at universities uh, have all knowledge and then we translate it to uh, society. Uh, secondly, that human beings are living and learning in more or less international social context in their whole life. Why should we close our eyes to this fact when it comes to our students and their learning processes in higher education? Thirdly, that learning is a natural, lifelong, ongoing process. We can only win if we get our alumni back to our university, universities of a period of working life. By the way, a new survey from the University of Urugu shows that University West seems to be the only one having mutual cooperation with partners outside the university as a central aspect in our vision document. We are exclusive even when we say in our brand that we are crazy enough. We do know that the challenges in our world are complex and global. We have to face anti-democratic tendencies in our countries. Refugees are coming to our countries because they had to escape from war and persecution. It is not only humanity that should make us act human. It is even curiosity and the conviction that we have to learn from each other, both in terms of knowledge and life experience, in order to together build a better and sustainable world based on knowledge, democracy, humanity. This has to be a process with people from all over the world in both. And once again, together, we are thousands and thousands of game changers taking place and checking out how tall we are and how far we can reach out. It's up to us to offer generous and trust-based solutions and to act accordingly to them. And I hope that this seminar will give us a great opportunity to contribute to this. Thank you. The French Institute chose a, a few themes uh, that will drive its works on the year. And this year it was democracy, which has been chosen as one of the main topics. And for example, we organized last Friday a conference on democracy and populism. Among these yearly themes, one is usually implemented on a regional level, I mean between all uh, Nordic countries. And we chosen for this year globalization and inequalities. This topic has been differently addressed according to the countries. For example, in Norway, it was energy in Africa, uh, circular economy in Finland, uh, climate change changes in Denmark, and here uh, we chosen refugees in higher education. Um, all these topics need to be tackled at an international level and this seminar is an excellent opportunity to make connections 
between French and Nordic networks. And initiatives too. Uh, and we will have the opportunity also to include, include German and Greek points of views. I've been asked recently why I've chosen this topic. Well, first, I really, I really and I do think that higher education institutions, universities, university colleges are strong drivers for social inclusion and therefore everyone. Secondly, I'm convinced also that everyone's skills must, must be recognized in order to get integrated in the society, the job market, or simply not to lose competencies. It's also important that people can keep hope, especially refugees, uh, and this is not only for refugees, but I guess for all of us, all, all of us in this day. You know better than I the challenges between, between, behind this seminar, so I, I won't elaborate on that. But the only way that the French Institute can contribute is to bring you together. And I thank you, all of you, for attending this seminar. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Marita Hilligas, and I have the privilege and honor on behalf of the Association of the Swedish Higher Education Institutions, SUHF, almost impossible to pronounce, uh, to welcome you all. Uh, through SUHF, all 37 uh, higher education institutions work together, and we do work on things things that we do better when we do it together. And we work on things that we couldn't do if we didn't do it together. And as you understand, there are very many things people do better together. So there are many things that we actually could do. So we have to prioritize. And one of the things that the Swedish Higher Education Institution has prioritized is to work on refugee questions together. We have formed a committee for academic refugees that is now on its third year working together. And this committee has done important work trying to pinpoint the possibilities as well as the challenges within the higher education institutions themselves and in the rules and regulations that put frames to what the higher education institutions can do. So dialogue, learning, influencing laws, etc. is on our agenda. I also have the, uh, the honor to uh, thank people. I think it's important to thank. Uh, and I would like to thank some people present here today. Um, the support group network at, Re at Riesta Gård firstly. Thank you, Rageb Aljaor, Inam Algoal and Adnan Abdul Ghani, for doing this together with us. To Riesta Gård for letting us be here. A very warm thank you to the Pro Vice Chancellor Jan Teleander and University West, one of our most engaged university members in refugee matters for making today possible in so many ways. To Santin Testas at the Institut Francais de Suède for supporting and building this initiative that we will take part of today. To the SUHF Committee for Academic Refugees under the excellent leadership of Cecilia Christensen, Vice Rector of Malmö University, another very experienced university member, experienced in promoting diversity, for its professional and wholehearted work for making us better together. And to Hanna Schmidt, Senior Advisor at the European University Association and a very skilled project manager for this conference. She made this happen. Today we are here to listen, to learn, to share, 
and together become clearer on how to reach our goals diversity, inclusion and democracy. I wish us all a very fruitful day. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for all the kind words. I could also do the long list of thanking, but I think it's, it's very important that we all did this together. Not only the ones of us who've been mentioned already, but you're all here because you made a, a fantastic effort to prepare yourself, to travel, to organize, so thank you very much. For UA, of course, it's, it's natural to take part, to co-organize something like this, because this is right at the heart of, of what we do at UA. And one of the biggest issues that we address at the moment is democracy. Uh, it's a great challenge in, in all of Europe. Um, and it's not only a challenge in, in, for inclusion and diversity, it's, it's a real threat uh, in many countries. So therefore we think it's, it's essential that we come together and we discuss the way forward, make some quite concrete steps. We started already in, in 2015 uh, making a recommendation to all European universities uh, on taking the challenge of uh, inclusion and working together with refugees. We collected through the uh, EUA Refugee Welcome Map as many initiatives as we could find and have universities actually report to us. And that map is still ongoing. Uh, it's part of the project, the EMEA project that uh, Johannes Kluz will talk about later, uh, that we're very proud of participating in too. Uh, so, so many things are going on. I could make the list of what we proposed back in 2015, which is very close to all the other recommendations, and I think in some ways have foreshadowed some of the ones that came after that. But I think it indicates that there is, of course, a million things we could do, but there are also a core number of things that are essential uh, for helping refugees integrate you, but also for them to bring us diversity, to bring us into association and realization that the world is bigger than what we have. And many of us come to universities to get that experience. It opens a new world in many different ways, not only academically, but also socially. I think that is really important. I don't think I'm going to say so much more now. I think. Uh, we're all itching to get started, I think, uh, to have discussions. I know a lot of you come with ideas, even if you're not on the list of speakers. I hope that you will contribute uh, and share your experiences uh, in many different ways, during the sessions, during the coffee shops, during lunch, and so on, and that you will bring this with you home, that what we get, get out of talking with you with refugees, representatives of refugees, to make our stronger together. Thank you. Thank you very much for starting out so well with all the perspectives. Um, and uh, I think it's excellent that we are going to do this together. We are both working together and learning together. And uh, going home today with things that we actually bring a change to happen. This has never happened in my life that I am five minutes early in a program. I'm almost, I almost earn an applause for that. <laughs> but that's good, that's good. Um, so I will start out, since we're all here, we're not going to wait for 10.15. Uh, and I think you do not need a stretch at this time. I can see your faces. You're still engaged. You still look happy. You still look like you. Ooh, I'm not going to fall down here. That you are now excited to get started. Um, uh, I think also I would just like to add one dimension here because I think it was so great to hear all these five um, co-hoster organizations about what we're going to do. But I would just like to add one more thing, and that's about sustainable development. Because we share a world that we really take to have responsibility for all of us. 
And uh, uh, like I mentioned last week, we had the UNESCO chair, Charles Hopkins. And with all the wording and all the 17 goals and the 163 partial goals for the um, Agenda 2030, I think he summarized it very good about sustainability. Uh, and he said, it's coming from a proverb, coming from a, an African tribe, uh, and I think it's very good. It's five words, and I think you can remember them from now on and forever. It's enough for all forever. Enough for all forever. And I think that's a very good foundation for what we're going to do here today as well. So I give you that. Enough for all forever. That is really uh, sustainability.